Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Rico's Rants. I'm your host, Rico DiGiorgio. Okay, first off, I want to apologize for having been gone forever. Um, I know, it pisses me off that I made this whole big deal about like, hey, I'm going to do a bunch of horror films over the whole course of October for you know Halloween and whatnot, and then didn't do shit. Um, lots of things uh, happening, but the main one is just I wasn't feeling good. And if you are a fan of me, you know that that happens a lot, but my whole thing is because I'm very passionate about Rico's Rants, as well as my fans, as well as the movies I review, or just rant. Um, I wanted, I was tired of just giving subpar reviews when I just wasn't feeling great. Um, so I kind of made a conscious decision, even though it was eating me up, the fact that I wasn't able to do as many as I wanted to do. <sighs> now I'm feeling good. I've been feeling good since yesterday, which means I was been sick for like three weeks. Like, I just have not been feeling great. Uh, yesterday, day before, I, it's, but now I'm finally like, okay, got some time to myself. I've seen lots of movies. We're going to get through this. So, because it is Halloween month, October month, whatever, I'm going to do Cabin in the Woods. So, first off, if you are a fan of horror films and you haven't seen this film, I'm going to spoil it. So, you may want to walk away. Because real, true horror fans will really appreciate this. Because it takes the horror genre and it not... I mean, it pokes fun in the sense that it's sort of a love letter. It's also kind of like a love-hate letter, where it very much talks about the things that, specifically the filmmakers, um, were not, and those that's uh, Drew Goddard and Joss Whedon, where they're sort of like, we're t sort of tired of all this torture porn shit. What about the good old days, where you really just needed a cabin in the woods to make a horror film? Whether, whether it's... Evil Dead, or whether it's Friday Thirteenth, or or whatever. So they're also having their cake and eating it too, because this does feature lots of gore and, but it's very funny. So the majority of the cast I can't remember because a lot of the cast is well, a lot of the main cast is sort of meh, sort of a new generation of young people, with the exception of Chris Hemsworth. That's right, the mighty Thor is in this. This was, he had been in this before he was cast as Thor, but it didn't get released until after he was Thor. Kind of like, maybe around the same time, like, oh, Thor's doing good, we should release this. And also, I think he had just been in Star Trek as well. So he was sort of an up-and-coming Aussie in America an actor. And he's, you know, he shines in this. Chris Hemsworth's great in it. But he doesn't steal the show. He's very much, I'm going to be the jock kind of alpha male character. And he fits it uh, beautifully. Um, the ones who shine for me are Richard Jenkins and Bradley Whitford. So I'll talk about them in a minute. But ultimately, i got to tell you the basic plot five college students and they all represent the alpha or not the alpha the the archetype characters in the average horror film you've got the jock athlete type of character chris hemsworth's character you have the scholar who is um his friend who is sort of just like he's also a big jock looking kind of guy but he also um is very much like into studies um he, there's also the the slut, essentially. And that is Chris Hemsworth's girlfriend. She's kind of a ditzy, blonde, promiscuous party girl, even though, and I'll get to that, uh, she's really not. Then you have the fool, who in this, um, I think his name is Franz Krantz. This fucking dude is awesome. Uh, I don't know if I've seen him in much of anything, but he stole the show, stole the movie in this apart from Richard Jenkins and Bradley Woodford. Um, just perfect. And he is the stoner 
character and he's got a he's got a rasp he's kind of i can't really do his voice he, he just sounds like he smokes pot all the time and sounds like a burnout all all the time he just frequently like what uh, I think it just like, but he's also the only voice of reason. He's the only one who gets what's going on. Finally, you have the Virgin. The Virgin being the, in your average classic horror films, especially from the 70s and 80s, uh, the, it was known as the uh, last, the sur last surviving girl, or the lone girl, or however you want to phrase it, um, where it was usually a young woman usually a teenager, and 99% of the time a virgin. The This was sort of coined and made up by John Carpenter for Halloween. The main reason why is because, well, all these, all these kids are having sex, which is why the killer can get them. I need someone who is going to be the good girl. It didn't intend for her to be the virgin, but then every other filmmaker and horror film sort of said, oh, she's the virgin. The, the virgin wins, that kind of thing. So this character, and I'm blanking on the names and everything, I'll just refer to them as the archetypes. She's not, like, they're not those archetypes with the exception, more or less, of the fool. What they are, in the beginning of the film, what they're told is that, oh, Chris Hemsworth's character has a cousin who has a cabin in the woods. And they go off to go check it out. Then, and, begin, and throughout the whole film, starting from the, from the very beginning, we realize that, the government is controlling this. It's an underground thing underneath the cabin. It's an under, underground facility where these office workers and not so much government officials, just guys in lab coats and ties and just looking bored and talking about their boring lies and about how, like, like the dynamic, especially between Richard Jenkins and Bradley Whitford, who are both perfect for these roles, especially because I think they both came from the West Wing, at least Bradley Whitford did. They both look like just, oh, I gotta go to the office. But in their their office is just like we gotta manipulate these five college kids to basically awaken a horrible monster type thing. Be killed and as long as the the slut is the first to go and the virgin is the last one either to survive or to die. Um, that's a, that's negotiable. The only thing is that she has to suffer. And we find out, again, spoiler, that it's all about pleasing the gods. There are these giant gods that are underneath and sort of trapped underneath. And they're okay with being trapped underneath if they get sacrifices. And... After a while, it wasn't just cutting through the heart, holding up, you know, cutting through the chest, holding up the heart. Do, 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 do. They kind of were like, well, we want something. We, their appetites have, have evolved over the years. So that's really what horror films have become is that they're, they're in a weird way, homages to this situation. So the government has been implementing and implanting and manipulating um, these five people to make them become the archetype uh, stereotypical characters in the horror films. Like Chris Hemsworth you know, is is, norm, is like a political um, strategist in, or he's like studying something that's not football, even though he looks like a football jock type. And he the, the release pheromones and, 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 and like their hair dye and in their uh, weed and, and, and deodorant and whatnot, and it's secreting into them, and it's making them be like making Chris Hemsworth be like more bro and kind of more of a douche nozzle and throwing people in, you know, throwing his girlfriend in the lake, being an overall jock asshole. So they're making these characters to appease the gods. So when they're in the cabin of the woods, and the cabin is creepy, and on the way there, they meet the 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 uh, town crazy nut guy said, you know, he's speaking Bible verses about Judgment Day and, you know, and being super racist and, you know, he's, he, they, I mean, he's like an homage, like the Ralph character in Friday 13, just like, he's coming for you, he's coming, pray for Jesus, like, just like, whoa, dude, you're crazy, like, run away, get out of here, and that st st stupid fucking thing. 
So they get to the cabin. The cabin's creepy. They start unpacking. They find hidden things. Like there's a one-way uh, mirror. Look, you know, just for looking in on, on the other people. And they kind of realize this cabin's a little bit creepier than they initially thought. They find a trap door, which is open, opens up by itself. And someone says, maybe it was the wind. And the stoner is just like, and that makes what kind of sense? Because like I said, he's the only one who's like, there's something going on. You are all stupid. And the reason why is because he's been smoking so much, such powerful weed that when they laced his weed to make him more stupid and, and, and um, easier to manipulate, it had no effect on him. So he's just been like, he's hearing voices because they'll have someone whisper like, go out, go outside. He's like, go outside. Go for a walk. Go for a walk. I'm not going for a walk. You can't tell me what to do. I'm my own man. I'm not a puppet. That's right. I think I'll go for a walk. And then he goes for a walk. He just, see, he is a stoner, so he does unintentionally do the things that they want him to do. So they go through the trap door, and they find all these random objects that signify and are homages to horror films, which will have their uh, Cabin in the Woods version of that horror version. For example, there's the cube in uh, the Hellraiser cube, which kind of opens up like a Rubik's Cube and releases the demons. In this one, it's sort of a spherical um, egg type thing, and but still moves around, and uh, Chris Hemsworth is picking it up and kind of slowly manipulating it. One person is about to pick up a conch shell, um, one other person is about to open up a music box. One person is about to open up a diary. And you can sense something's going to happen if whatever they do. It's the virgin who picks up the diary and says, Hey guys, look at this. Now, it go cuts over to the fact that all the office workers, the guys controlling this ship, having a poll about which monster's going to be picked. You, you, you chose werewolves. You guys chose this. Oh, guys, sorry. It was the... Christian hillbilly zombie family. Sorry. And they all lost money and some won money. And it's it's fucking funny. It's like if you took The Office, which admittedly I've only seen a little bit of a, but I know enough to um, have an appreciation for it. If you took The Office and put it in a Friday 13th film and combined the two, that's what this is. And it's not a disparaging thing. This is, this is one of the freshest, newer horror films I've seen a long time. Yeah, it's bloody. Yeah, it's gory. It's got nudity. It's got sex. It's got drugs. It's got all the classic archetypes of a horror film, especially from the 70s and 80s. But it's a new way of looking at it. Now, we're... Honestly, I can't think of too many issues with the film. Um... I thought Drew Goddard did a fantastic uh, job directing this, and this was he and Joss Whedon, who wrote, Joss Whedon wrote um, wrote it. I think co-wrote it with him. Um, they were business partners um, from the work on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and you could see that there's a chemistry. It's a natural dynamic between the two of them. Um, there are some frequent Joss Whedon character uh, actors that kind of come back. Not so much. Um, there's one I think is. God, Thomas Lank, I think. He's from Buffy. Um, he kind of shows up as an intern. Um, yeah, like I said, I can't be too critical of the film. Uh, all the actors are great. Whoever plays who does a fantastic job. I kind of felt like the actor who played the scholar was kind of overshadowed by everyone, especially by the fool and the athlete he just was kind of there he was just more of a filler for me but I have laughed this hard at a horror film in quite a long time I mean this this one I, well, I, I remember seeing it in theaters and I went with a girlfriend and she was not a fan of horror films at all and I remember we watched this together and she was like that was really good are they all like this I'm like no, they're not all like this at all. This was amazing compared to what the fuck I've seen in the past. And that's why, that, the best way I can describe it is like what Scream was 
for the 90s, which was, it's still a, it's still a horror film, it's still kind of scary, it also self-deprecates its own genre. That's what Scream does, that's what Cabin in the Woods does. And that's fine, because horror films can be funny. I mean, it's always kind of an interesting way of throwing the horrific with the hilarious. That's kind of why Freddy Krueger became as popular as he was, because he was a wisecracking guy. I mean, he got a little bit too goofy. And then they kind of spawned, like, Chucky becoming really more jokey and Leprechaun just in general. I mean, you, you still have your serious ones like Jason and Michael Myers and Leatherface. Who, if they said anything, they may crack a, they may crack a snarky remark. But for something like this, this works perfectly. Uh, being funny and being uh, impressive. In the sense of, like, the movie Get Out. Get Out was new and a w an interesting way of looking at, one, films, two, horror films. And three, I mean, for Get Out, just all about racism. Um, but the greatest dynamic between the two... Uh, the greatest thing I love was the dynamic between Richard Jenkins, Bradley Whitford, because they are, I can't stop gushing about them. They're so funny in this and they're, they just, they're just going to work and their work happens to be fucking horrifying. All about, yeah, we gotta, we have to make sure this virgin suffers. We have to make sure the blonde, uh, ditzy bitch dies, um, and yet they're still talking about like how they have to have safety things uh, for the shelves for their little kid, their little toddler. He's like, I can't open the fucking drawer. Like I have to kind of stick my hand and open it, which I found in particularly very funny because at the time and even now, my, my both my brothers have little kids. So they have these little fucking barrier things where you have to kind of, you can't open it all the way. You have to kind of shove your hand and open it and pop it out that way. So I found that fucking hysterical. I'm like, good God, I can relate. I mean, everyone can relate to that in some degree, but that was just fresh. I was like, oh shit, this is really funny. Um, one of the funny things, well, again, spoiler, um, most of the people die. Let's just put it that way, because you can't have a horror film without anybody dying, but... In fact, everyone does. Um, but the final two survivors are basically the fool and the virgin. And they had found an elevator that goes down into the military government base or whatever. And when they, they're in a sort of elevator and they can see that they're in an elevator which houses other each other elevator that's nearby and there's like a thousand of them houses a or holds another horror villain type archetype so there's a killer clown there's the leather face type character there's a giant cobra there's a fucking little demon ballerina girl there's the zombies there is a giant tarantula and so on and so on and so on like i mean it is when i watched it i freeze framed it just to see everything that I could possibly see, it is it is a a Where's Waldo of hor for horror fans. It's like, oh my god, there's there's a fucking unicorn in this, and the unicorn shows up and just like it's it stabs a guy with its fucking horn. Like that's you take something even just kind of cutesy and make it horrific. It's awesome. One of the reoccurring themes that Bradley Whitford's character is that he put his money in to find a mermaid a mermaid he's like he's like that's what i want them to easily like, and uh chris hemsworth is holding this conch he's about to blow it and then obviously the diary is the one that's chosen and he he's kind of staring up and richard jenkins like kind of looking pissed off and richard jenkins comes up he's like yeah you know maybe next time he's like he had it in his hand man i'm never gonna fucking see a mermaid so when I, I'm spoiling the fucking funniest part for me. Um, when the fool and the virgin like, get into the base, they unleash all the monsters. Like, well, fuck these guys. They want us to die. Fuck them. So they unleash all the monsters. All these monsters, killer clown, tarantula, giant snake, all that shit, are attacking all the military uh, people. 
And in the middle of all that, uh, Bradley Whitford's character gets knocked over by a giant explosion. He's laying there on the ground, just like, uh, all kind of, you know, his head, he's all kind of delirious. He's like, ugh. And he kind of hears something and sees something through some mist in front of him. And it's this creature that's slowly crawling towards him and kind of making a weird slimy sound. And it gets closer to him. And you have this kind of epic mu music kind of swelling. And he blinks his eyes. Realizes the fucking merman crawling towards him. And he goes, oh, come on. And the fucking merman bites him on the face and shoots blood out of its gills. And that's how he dies. That is fucking funny. He, this whole time, he's like, I'm never going to see him. Oh, there it is. Fuck. <laughs> Love it. Um, so now we're at the point where the big boss, where we find out that this isn't just the uh, America doing this. It's done all over the world. And Japan and, and every other country and whatnot have failed. Meaning the heroes, the the five, the, the people that are supposed to be killed survive and vanquish the evil. So really, in order to prevent the end of the world, because the gods are going to be upset and destroy the planet, um, ultimately, the fool has to be killed by the virgin to appease the gods. And they find that out by being told by the big boss, the one who's... Uh, head of the United States Department of this. And it's played by Sigourney Weaver. The one and only brilliant horror, in her own way, horror icon. She's just sort of the sci-fi version of Jamie Lee Curtis. Like, Jamie Lee Curtis would have almost been too spot on. So Sigourney Weaver would have been, it was, it was a good choice. And Sigourney Weaver has that air of authority She's tall, she's intimidating, she's beautiful, but she's kind of like, I'm not going to take shit from anybody. And you have to kill him to save the world. And ultimately, they kind of say, fuck you. You know what? Maybe there needs to be a change. If we have to sacrifice people to appease the gods, maybe we need to start over. And they kill her, and they both get injured, and they're both kind of lying there, contemplating the end of the world. Like, wow, giant gods, huh? Would have been interesting to see them. And they start rolling it, they start smoking a joint, passing it back and forth. And then, and the entire time, the earth is shaking and insinuating that the end of the world's coming. The gods are getting pissed off. The gods must be crazy. Um, and all of a sudden, a giant fucking fist punches through the base and punches through the cabin. And the giant hand lands like that. Ends. And the world happens. What a great fucking way of ending it. The funny thing is, I read, because I did some trivia uh, research about this, is Drew Goddard was asked on a, from like a panel, and one of the interviewers either hadn't done his homework or was just being stupid, said, will there be a sequel? And he said, did you see my movie? I honestly leave this the fuck alone. If they're ever planning to make a sequel, don't do it. You One, you can't do it. Two, it's perfect the way it is. Leave it the fuck alone. Great film. Honestly, um, I was told that I should maybe improve my rating system because five stars is kind of just very small and compact. So, um, would I, would I give it a four star rating on my old review, on my old rant? Yes. Um, Basically, what I'm my my new rating system will be is fucking hate it. It's okay. Yeah, you should see it. Go see this, and I fucking loved it. I fucking loved this film. I gave it a fucking big thumbs up. Holy shit. One, it's fresh. Two, it's an homage to the shit that we love but got tired of. It gives you everything that you kind of want. You know, you got your blood, you got your gore, you got your sex, you got your monsters, you got all the monsters, and you got humor. So easily, if you haven't seen Cabin in the Woods, go see Cabin in the Woods. 
Uh, the cast alone's great. The humor is great. The kills are very generic, but the kills are just generic in the beginning. Then once you get towards the other monsters, like I said, it's a freeze frame. Like, oh shit, oh fuck, oh my god, holy fuck, holy shit, fuck! Such a good movie. So, that's the first video. I'm going to try and make as many as I can tonight because I need to catch the fuck up. Happy Halloween. Love y'all. Bye, guys.